Now, the message I'd like to share with you today is called God Revealed in the Hebrew Alphabet. We're going to look at the first five letters of the Hebrew alphabet and see how it conveys a mission and purpose of God in the lives of mankind. So let's get started by looking at the first letter of the alphabet, which is known as Aleph. Aleph has the value of one. Basically, it's like our A in English, but it is actually a silent letter. Now, God is one. And so the, the number one and this first letter specifically refers to God the Father. He is the first. He is the Almighty. He is the Creator. It has meanings like being an ox or being a chief, being in charge. In other words, it relates to strength and power. There are many of God's names that begin with the letter Aleph. For example, Elohim, El, El Elyon. Adonai, Adir, the Glorious One, Aluf, Lord, El Olam, the Everlasting God, and even I Am Who I Will Be. Each word of that phrase begins with the letter Aleph. In other words, in Hebrew it's reading A, A, A. Abba, Father, also begins with Aleph. So there's a whole lot of tie-ins here with Almighty God, our Abba, Father, and the letter Aleph. Yet, the letter Aleph is a silent letter in Hebrew. It has no sound in and of itself. And God the Father chooses to reveal himself to us through his Son. So let's have a look at the next letter, which is the letter Bet. It's the second letter of the alphabet with a numerical value of 2. So if Aleph is the Father, then Bet will relate to the Son. And let's see how this links up. Does God have a Son? Many from a Jewish background will ask this question, where does it say in the Tanakh, or what we call the Old Testament, that God has a son? Well, one interesting verse is in Proverbs 30 verse 4, where it says, what is his name, and what is his son's name, if you know? Good question. Now, the word in Hebrew for father is made up of Aleph and Bet. It makes the word Av, which is father. So in other words, a father is one who is an Aleph, but has a Bet, has a son or has a child. And so without the, the Bet, there is no father. Without the son, there is no father. Uh, so there's an interesting connection here to make the word father. From the letter Bet, you get words like Ben, meaning son, or Benjamin, son of my right hand. Now, if you were to begin reading the Bible in Hebrew, uh, the first letter of the Bible is the letter Bet. Now, uh, many Jewish rabbis have debated this and wondered why would the Bible begin with the last letter of the alphabet? Why wouldn't it begin with the, sorry, with the second letter of the alphabet? Why doesn't it begin with the first letter of the alphabet? Now, if you were to um, read the Bible in Hebrew, uh, it's interesting to note that the Bible begins with the letter Bet. And the rabbis have had a debate and discussion, why doesn't the Bible begin with the letter Aleph? After all, the Aleph has all these links to Almighty God, to Adonai, to Abba Fava. Why doesn't the Bible begin with Aleph? Why does it begin with Bet? Furthermore, they point out that the letter Bet is like almost like an, an opening. And as you read in Hebrew from right to left in the direction of the arrow on your screen, the rabbis explained that it looks like basically the entire Torah, the entire scriptures, everything, and everything that was even created, comes out of that first letter. So you can see that first letter, Bet is there, and then everything comes out of it, the law, and even uh, the creation itself. And so they ponder, why was this letter chosen instead of Aleph? But we can, from a uh, a believing perspective see that this relates to the Son, the Son of God, Yeshua, because it says in John 1 3 that all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Indeed, it goes on to say that He was there in the beginning with God. So creation came through the Son, it came out of Him, and this is hinted to and alluded in the very beginning of the Bible, in the first letter of the Bible. Furthermore, when you read the Hebrew Bible, sometimes some letters are written larger than normal, 
Other times, some letters are written smaller than normal. And there is no set pattern to this. It just happens here and there in some verses. And the scholars and scribes have faithfully copied the way the scriptures are written from generation to generation, keeping those same larger letters in some places, smaller letters in other places, without an explanation. And one of those instances of the large letter is the first letter of the Bible, the Bet. And it is drawing our attention to this letter. It is as if it's being highlighted, saying there's something about this letter that you need to take notice of. Stop right here and see what's going on. And so I believe this is a sign that is pointing to that all of creation came through him, through the Son. And here it is right in the first letter of the Scriptures. If we look further into the letter Bet, we'll see that it has a meaning of a house. And so here someone has drawn in a cartoon to make Bet look a bit more like a house with a chimney and a window and a door. The word Bet means house. For example, you have Bethel or Bethel means house of God, or Bethlehem means house of bread. Now the son is the one who is building a house, and he's building a house for his bride. So it again connects back to the son. So in summary so far, Aleph is the father, the silent, the strong, eternal one. Bet is the son through whom all creation comes, the one who speaks on behalf of the father. Now our next letter is the letter Gimel, and here we'll begin to see the mission and plan and purpose coming into the forefront. So Gimel, as you can see on the screen, represents the number three. It's the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. Now the Torah, or the law, was given in the third month at Mount Sinai on Pentecost. In the same way, the Holy Spirit was poured out in the book of Acts on Pentecost in the third month on the very same day. In other words, the Holy Spirit is always in line with the Word of God and specifically with the Torah. He didn't come to lead us somewhere else, to lead us away from the foundation that God has given in the Scriptures from the very beginning. Sometimes as, as believers, we, can, we only focus on reading the New Testament but the, the Holy Spirit leads us in line with the entirety of the Scriptures, and we need to have the foundation in place going back to the Torah. So the Holy Spirit relates to this letter Gimel, the third person, the number three, was poured out on the, in the third month. He has three main characteristics or missions. He convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now one plus two is three. So he, he carries together the elements of God the Father and the Son as he represents them to us. And it brings together uniting of the Father and Son through the person of the Holy Spirit. One of the meanings coming out of this letter Gimel is Gamul, which means to nourish until completely ripe, to raise a child. And that is his mission is to train us, to prepare us, to equip us, to raise us up, to grow in the faith. Jesus, or Yeshua, when he left, said he's not going to leave us as orphans, but he left with us the Holy Spirit to nourish us, to raise us up, to prepare us for his coming, to bring us to maturity, and to remind us of his word and everything that he has said. It's interesting that Gimel also means a camel, and that makes me thinking of John the Baptist. He was a forerunner for Jesus, or Yeshua the Messiah, pointing us to him, and what does the scripture say about it? Well, uh, often the Bible doesn't say much about how people were clothed or what they wore. But for John, it makes an exception and explains that he was clothed in camel's hair. It would have been very unusual. And that would probably be why this is being highlighted in Matthew. It's being highlighted how he was dressed. It was getting people's attention to something about his dress that was different. And it relates to the camel. And... Camel is from the word Gimel and again relates to the Holy Spirit. And he had a ministry like the Holy Spirit. Now, Gimel is on a mission. The rabbis explain that the letter Gimel looks like a man walking. And the question is, where is he going? Let's go back to the alphabet for a moment. We've got the Aleph, we've got the Bet. And you can see that the Bet 
is pointing in this direction where the arrow is going. So coming out of the bet, coming out of the Aleph and bet, is the Gimel, representing the Holy Spirit. But where is the Holy Spirit going? You can see the direction of where he's walking is away from the Aleph and bet towards a goal and a destination. So the Father and Son are sending the Holy Spirit, but sending him where? To the next letter, the Dalit. Dalit is the fourth letter, and it represents a door. But it also means a poor person. Someone who is broken, someone who is struggling. And so the Holy Spirit is being sent on a mission from the Aleph and Bet to the door of the poor and humble and desperate person. The one who is broken, the one who is struggling. In Revelation 3 we have a familiar verse where Jesus or Yeshua says, Behold, I stand at a door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. So knocking on the door of the heart is ultimately God himself through Yeshua but represented by the Holy Spirit knocking on the door where in some ways all of us have closed our doors to God. He wants us to open up the door to welcome him in. We often use this verse to talk about those who are non-believers that God is knocking on the door of their hearts through the Holy Spirit. But this verse in its context is talking to the church of Laodicea. And he says to them only a few verses earlier, Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy, have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Look at the description of this church. They believe they're doing so well, but God sees them as wretched, miserable, and poor. In other words, there is a huge lack in their lives, and they are like the Dalit. They are missing something. They are missing God's presence. They are missing being close to Him. They have missed the plot. They have missed God's purpose. There might be sin issues going on in their lives. There are issues that are, that are going on that have not been dealt with. And so they are poor. But God wants to come and bring life into that situation, bring transformation. And so the Holy Spirit is coming and there is a knock on the door. And if they open up the door, if they open up and repent where they have sinned, if they open up from any area where they have closed the door to God himself, where they have just done their own thing and not let him in, but now if they open up that area where he is knocking, where he is prodding, and allow him in, allow him to take charge, allow him to minister in, then that situation that has been wretched, miserable and poor can be transformed by the power of God. So we're going to see what happens when the Gimel comes to the Dalit, the transformation that happens. We will see this on the next, the next letter, which is known as the letter Hay. So what happens if we open the door to him? To God himself. Well, the fifth letter is the number of grace. And so we're going to talk about grace. We're not going to talk about the grace and power of God because hay represents God's mercy in our lives. It represents life and breath. It's actually impossible to say the letter hay without breathing out. Try it. Just try. You have to go hay. And so there is life and breath coming through this. Now it represents God himself. God's holy, sacred name, known in English as Jehovah, is made up of the letter He twice in it, just in a four-letter name, two of the letters is the letter He. In abbreviations of God's name in Hebrew, they simply write the letter He and an apostrophe next to it to show it's an abbreviation. So it points to God himself. He who was and is and is to come. And that phrase, he who was and is and is to come, is made up of just those letters found in the, the name Jehovah. Again, those three letters, including the hay. So hay points to God himself. And so we just talked about the dull, the broken, the poor, the miserable, the wretched individual who is far away from God, but the knock is on the door of their heart. And so what happens when the Holy Spirit comes in is that the image of God is restored. So look at this for a moment. Here's a dull, broken, poor, and struggling. 
and then the presence of God comes in and now that person who's broken, poor and struggling is made again and restored again into the image of God, carrying his name, being known by a hay, not by a dullard, being known by God's grace, not by their fall. And that's what God does. He takes us from our fall, takes us from our mistakes, and we're no longer known by our, our mistakes and our past, but known by his name that is placed upon us. That is the privilege and power of the gospel. That is the privilege and power of the work of God in our lives. He transforms us. He gives us new hope and new life. It's not the end. He gives us uh, a new start and a new beginning. When we feel that we have failed and we can't get any further, He is there with His grace. And as we turn to Him, as we open up, He restores that image in our lives. Not only does He restore the image, but he brings fruitfulness. Hay links to fruitfulness. Now, in Hebrew, if you add the letter hay to the end of a word, it normally makes it into the feminine form. The feminine form is the form that brings fruit, that gives life, that gives birth. And let's have a look at how this works out. You see, Jesus said in John 15 that he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Without me, you can do nothing. In other words, without me, you're like a dullard. You are mi miserable, wretched, and poor. But as you abide in me and as I abide in you, I'll make you like a hay and I'll make you fruitful. Now, when Abram and Sarai were on their journey and they were learning to walk with God, there came a point when God encountered them and changed their names. And this happened in the fifth encounter God had with Abram. In other words, the encounter of grace. And he changed their names, and much has been said about the name change. But in Hebrew, the name change is very simple. In Hebrew, all that happens with the name change from Abram to Abraham is the addition of the letter He. All that happens with the name change of Sarai to Sarah is the addition of the letter He. And so He is added into their lives. The presence of God ministering into the broken area, the things that are missing. In particular, the lack of fruitfulness they had as a couple, the barrenness that had afflicted them for so many years. And look at what God says to Abram. He says in Genesis 17:5, No longer will your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations, and I will make you exceedingly fruitful. So God takes broken, poor humanity, where we are at, where we have failed, and as we open up the door to him, he restores us. But not only does he restore us, but he makes us fruitful, because he is a God who gives life, and he wants us to be in his image, one who gives life, one who bears fruit. That is his purpose and plan for our lives. And so he doesn't just restore us to himself, but he makes us useful for his purpose. He empowers us and fills us with his whole Holy Spirit to make us bring fruit and be very fruitful. So I hope this has been a blessing to you and I'd just like to encourage you that if you're in this situation, it's time to open up the door to God and say, God, please, I repent of my sin wherever I have held you back, wherever I might have closed the door to you, I now open up the door to you. Come into my life, come into this area where I've held you away and I repent of any area where there's been sin in my life. And just name it before him. Just name it before him and allow his forgiveness in your life. And so I thank you, Father God, that you're ministering right now to the people listening, that you're bringing life and a renewal of the image of God in their lives. In Yeshua's name, amen. So uh, if this teaching has been a blessing to you, uh, then I'd encourage you to subscribe to us on YouTube so you can continue to get our next upcoming teaching videos please uh, share this video with your friends and also if you'd like to support our ministry or learn more about us read some of our articles or subscribe to our newsletter go to www.pastorenoch.com.au thank you so much and may god bless you